it's me again nurse clary and in this video i'm going to talk about spinal cord injury so this is still under the nervous system injury on my previous videos i discussed about nervous system simple anatomy and physiology and neuroassessment i also discuss about head injury which is under nervous system injury so right now i'll be discussing about spinal cord injury but before that let's think about this question a patient with a spinal cord injury is admitted to the unit and placed in traction which of the following actions is the nurse responsible for when caring for this patient select all that apply remember when answering select all that apply select all that apply we will use true or false so letter a modifying the traction weights as needed then letter b assessing the patient's skin integrity letter c applying the traction upon admission letter d administering pain medication and letter E, providing passive range of motion. So right now, let's um, define first spinal cord injury. Spinal cord injury refers to damage to the spinal cord resulting from trauma like car crash or from disease or degeneration. Damage to any part of the spinal cord or nerves at the end of the spinal canal or cauda equina. So, um... Often it causes permanent changes in strength, sensation, and other body functions below the site of the injury. So your ability to control your limbs after a spinal cord injury depends on two factors. The first one is about the location, while the second one is about the severity. So let's define first location. Remember, our spine is divided into cervical, thoracic, lumbar spine, sacrum, and coccyx bones. So the higher the injury is, the more problems you will have because anything below that injury will be affected. So all of the functions below that will be affected. And it, uh, it also depends on the severity. When you say severity of the injury, it is often called the completeness. So severity is what we know as completeness. And remember, our spine has posterior and anterior part. The posterior part of our spine is responsible for the sensory functions, while the anterior part of the spine is responsible for our motor functions. And we do have ascending tract and descending tract. To transmit those um, sensory that we feel from our posterior part of the spine and then the ascending tract will transmit that to the brain and it, the brain will interpret that and then the brain will transmit it through the descending tract and then there will be a motor response that is the reason why the higher the injury is the more problem you will have so after this is there are two main classification that is what we call the um complete and incomplete so the two main class classifications are complete and incomplete so let's define complete both sensory and motor functions are lost so if all feeling sensory and all ability to control movement motor function are lost below the spinal cord injury your injury is called complete so like for example the c1 to c3 where the phrenic nerve is so there will be respiratory failure and the patient will be quadriplegia there will be the erectile dysfunction bowel or bladder problems so for the incomplete spinal cord injury either sensory or motor functions are lost so if you have some motor or sensory function below the affected area your injury is called incomplete and there are varying degrees of incomplete injury because we do have the anterior which is for the motor functions and the posterior which is for the sensory function so therefore if the anterior part is being affected again there will be motor loss but sensory still intact while posterior there will be sensory loss and the motor function is still intact so the causes are motor vehicle accidents falls gunshot wounds sport injuries and surgical 
complications. So it's like almost the same with the head injury. It's just that the spine is the one being affected. So when it comes to the signs and symptoms, spinal cord injuries can cause one or more of the following signs and symptoms. The first one is loss of movement. So these signs and symptoms will depend on the part or the location and the severity of the injury on the spine. So loss of movement, loss of, of or altered sensation including the ability to feel heat, cold, and touch, loss of bowel or bladder control, exaggerated reflex activities or spasms, changes in sexual function, sexual sensitivity, and fertility, pain or an intense stinging sensation caused by damage to the nerve fibers in your spinal cord. Difficulty breathing, coughing, or clearing secretions from your lungs. So let's now move on with the diagnostic tests um, used to diagnose the spinal cord injury. They are CT scan, MRI, X-ray, EMG, or electromyogram. So in an emergency, a healthcare provider makes sure a spinal cord injury isn't affecting your breathing or heart rate. Next, they'll assess how well your nerves are working. The provider checks motor function or your ability to move parts of your body, sensory function, or your ability to feel touch. Certain imaging tests can help diagnose a spinal cord injury like the CT scan to see broken bones, blood clots, or blood vessel damage. MRI to see the spinal cord or soft tissues. X-ray to show broken bones or dislocations. Bones knock out of, of place. So a healthcare provider may also use an EMG to check electrical activity in muscles and nerve cells if there are coexist peripheral nerve injury. After this, there are a lot of um, possible complications for the spinal cord injury, but these three are the most common. So the first one is autonomic dysreflexia or hyperreflexia, which is a syndrome in which there is a sudden onset of excessively high blood pressure. It is more common in people with spinal cord injuries that involve the thoracic nerves of the spine or above T6. T6. So, a dangerous spike in blood pressure, slow heartbeat, constriction of your peripheral blood vessels, other changes in your body's autonomic functions. So, next is neurogenic shock. It is a combination of both primary and secondary injuries that lead to loss of sympathetic tone and thus unopposed parasympathetic response driven by the vagus nerve. So, cons consequently, patients suffer from instability in blood pressure, heart rate, and temperature regulation. So, there, there could be systemic hypotension and bradycardia. So, spinal shock is the loss of muscle tone and spinal reflexes below the level of a severe spinal cord lesion. The shock does not imply a state of circulatory collapse but of suppressed spinal reflexes below the level of cord injury. So there could be flaccid paralysis, anesthesia, or reflexia, or hyperreflexia. So the management, actually the management for spinal cord injury mostly is supportive management. And it will be, and it depends on the situation of the patient or the case of the patient. So supportive, enhancing independence and quality of life. Number two, maintaining patency of the airway and then number three is actually immobilization and number four is more on assistance on the ADL, ADL or activities of daily living so recovering the skills needed for the ADL and number five is steroid or methylprednisone some research suggests that a corticosteroid injection may help spinal cord injuries. The medication should be given within 8 hours after the injury of course. This treatment may improve blood flow, preserve nerve function, and reduce inflammation. And of course, um, the in there could be um, reducing the risk of chronic or ongoing health conditions. That is number 6 for the management. 
and number seven is restoring some nerve function in partial injuries so um, mostly the management for the spinal cord injury is um, case to case basis so let's now answer this question. A patient with a spinal cord injury is admitted to the unit and placed in traction. Which of the following actions is the nurse responsible for when caring for this patient? So SATA. So we will use true or false, modifying the traction weights as needed. We all know that the healthcare provider is the one responsible for initial application of the traction as well as for the change of the weight of the traction. So this is false. Next is assessing the patient's skin integrity. This is true because we are nurses and we are responsible for the assessment and care of the skin due to the increased risk of skin breakdown. Next is applying the traction upon admission that would be for the healthcare provider. I, I already discussed it earlier, so that is false. Administering pain medication. This is true since this is part of our job to administer appropriate analgesic as ordered and then providing passive range of motion this is actually true as well because passive range of motion helps prevent contracture contractures this is often performed by a physical therapist or a nurse since we are a nurse so we also perform this so two four five is the answer for this question Okay guys, thank you for watching this video. If you like this video, kindly just hit like and subscribe on my channel. I'll be posting more about the um, nursing reviews. On my next video, I will be discussing about epilepsy and seizure. Thank you. Bye.